It's an annual tradition here on Bootleg, our favorite annual tradition. It's the 10 Gem Specials, where we dedicate two entire shows to 10 offensive players and 10 defensive players that we absolutely adore. It's not about being the best. It's not about being the the highest drafted uh, 10 prospects on either side of the ball. It's just the ones that we really, really like. Uh, so, EJ, two things I'll ask of you before we get started. One, how are you? Two, what is your definition of a gem? Just to make sure that folks know what, what they're in for for the next hour or so. I'm great. It's one of the best days of the year. One of our favorite days of the year. We just get to sit around and do what we started this podcast to do, which is you know, have a drink, talk about football players that we really like watching. And that is the basis of a gem. Again, as you said, these are not necessarily the highest graded players or the players we think are going to be the best pros necessarily or anything else. If gems were movies, it would be the movie that comes on and no matter where it is or what you're doing, you whip the remote to the couch, sit down and watch the rest of it. Those are these players. When we're watching endless hours of tape, getting ready for the draft, you know, this player's tape comes on and you're like, all right, popcorn, kick your feet back. This is just fun. You might, I don't know, yell a little bit at like 1130 at night when the rest of your family's asleep. Sorry, family. Uh, Because these players are hilariously fun to watch. They're just great football players. They're the reason we got into this business, which is why Gems is one of the best episodes we do every single year. Uh, We're not going to waste too much time just because it's such a jam-packed episode, but I will preface our number one gem, uh, and EJ and I each have five, making up this total of ten. We each fought valiantly over this first gem. Uh, We both wanted him, but, you know, because EJ is a local, so to speak, I backed down. I let him have the great Roma Dunze, uh, who... As far as just awesome players in this class, like guys that you're pretty damn sure are going to be really good in the NFL, uh, he might be at the very top of the list out of everybody in this whole class. Yeah, our buddy Daniel Jeremiah said Rome is his favorite player to watch in the draft. He didn't say the best player. He didn't say anything else. He said his favorite guy to watch in this entire draft is Roma Dunze. I suffer from the same affliction. Uh, yes, war was waged, and you know it was a valiant fight for good reason. <laughs> Rome is a tremendous player. Wide receiver Washington, we're talking about Roma Dunze, the leader on that offense, 92 catches, 1,640 yards, 13 TDs this season, averaged 17.8 per. That is elite special production. It's even more impressive because, again, he's on a team with two other wide receivers that are going to get drafted, Jalen McMillan and Polk. So... 10 games over 100 yards, that is ridiculous. And he had a good year last year. This is not a one-hit wonder. Understands the route tree and what he needs to do in each situation. It's one of the things that makes him special is that he's good at everything. You might look at him and say, oh, he's he's tall, 6'3". He's probably not that fast. No, he was a 200-meter champion in Nevada in high school. He is fast. We saw that in testing understands routes tremendous body control especially around the sidelines the sort of acrobatic catches are the norm for him you got to see that usc and especially in the end zone arizona is a great example of that elite at snapping off routes you were near the cones during his drills and combines could just feel the difference of how he can do that shows up on tape over and over again if he wants to put his numbers back towards Penix and throw a flash that target he can do it in an instant even at his size um, uses his you know big frame to shield the defender extremely well on lots of different catches, but those especially. Um, he's not going to create a ton of yak in contested situations. If you're going to look at that and say, oh, is there a weakness? Like when he's you know with a guy, he is going to catch the ball. He is going to shield the defender and catch the ball. It is not a 50-50 ball if you throw it at Rome. But he's not one of those guys necessarily that's going to come down, bull through contact, and get his yak that way. But he will running away from folks. If he is on a man crossing route, he will pick up Yak all day long. He is that kind of talented. One of the cool things about Rome that I really like, takes very few big shots. Even though he has that big frame and he's going to go up and contest catch situations, really sort of cognizant of where defenders are and twisting away from him, you really don't see him get lit up on tape which just allows him to be out there every week and showcase all those skills. Has punt return versatility, wins all over the field. My favorite thing about Rome is that he is very complete. You start saying, well, 
Might not be the fastest. Well, he's fast. He might not be the tallest. He's tall. Might not have great hands. Oh, well, he's got great hands. Might not have the greatest routes. Mm, no, he is a technician. And you start sort of thinking. And in that way, he reminds me of the way I felt about Larry Fitzgerald coming out. I'm not saying mm. Rome is Larry Fitzgerald. I'm saying you just kind of checked out. You're like, well, he's really big. Well, yeah, but he's really fast. Really good hands. Really smart. And I get the same vibe from Rome is there's just not very many things that he's not good at. Really good kid as well. In terms of guys, I would feel very solid sort of just handing in my report and like saying his name. Like, I don't have to bang the table for him. Everybody knows what he's doing. Like, I think we should draft Rome. And I think everybody around the table is just going to go, yeah, yeah, we should draft Rome. We feel perfectly safe with that. He is one of those players where if your number one goal is a franchise that has a top 10 pick, is to not miss on that top 10 pick, he's at the very top of the board. Like, if you don't need a quarterback and you can't trade out and you just have to pick a player that you know is going to be good, it's Roma Dunze. Uh, like, truly. And, well, Marvin or Rome, I should say. Like, because <laughs> Marvin, we know, is going to be good. Also uh, true. But I, you know, Marvin's at that point where everybody's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what about, you know, everybody just kind of throws Marvin to the side because we, we've known what he is for a long time at this point. But Rome, I, I want to emphasize, is in that same class of if you just need to hit, if you can't financially afford to <laughs> screw this pick up, you take Roma Dunze. Um, it's a big reason why, even though I don't think the Chargers are going to take him at five, depending on what happens with Keenan, I have to imagine he's going to be in consideration just because it's like, well, if we can't trade out, which they're going to be able to trade out, let's be honest, but if they couldn't <laughs> trade out, he would be in consideration just because they wouldn't they wouldn't miss. And Harbaugh obviously knows that. He played against Rome. Um, and he saw what Rome could do with his own eyes. Uh, you know, I think... The Giants, if he gets to the Giants, they're just going to take him because it's easy. If he gets to the Bears, talk about sprinting a pick in. Like That would be a record time for a ninth overall pick to get announced would be Roma Dudze if, he, if he's available to Chicago. He won't be, but in that scenario, they wouldn't even think about it. Um, he's just so easy. He does everything really well, and... You know, we talked uh, in the last episode about, you know, the value of being on the field at the Combine and, and just kind of feeling the difference between these guys up close in drills. Rome just feels different. There's a, there's a couple other receivers in this class where being around them broke a lot of ties in my mind. Rome was one of the ones where he broke ties, uh, even amongst guys that that didn't even work out. Like my, my tie between Adunze and neighbors was broken at the combine. Cause just seeing him up close, I'm like, yeah, that's it. You know, Leggett, who, who I'm going to talk about in just a second, broke a lot of ties with guys in his tier. Cause seeing him move in person, I was like, that's a starting receiver folks. <laughs> like you can just feel the difference. And, and Rome is absolutely one of those guys where you can feel when he's on the field. He's made so much impact for the Washington program over the last couple of years. Uh, it's a perfect time for him to come out. The league is extremely ready for his skill set. And like you said, if decision makers want a win and they're in the top, let's just say, seven picks, like Rome is going to be on the top of everybody's board, just like MHJ is going to be on the top of everybody's board until they're gone. And they're going to be gone very quickly, and everybody's just going to go, yeah, we didn't have a shot at that guy anyways. But for those teams... In that rare air, he's going to be in consideration with any other name on the board because he is a tremendously good football player. Now, my first gem, again, a name I just brought up a second ago, Xavier Leggett, South Carolina. Uh, another top, let's say top seven receiver in this class. because everybody's, everybody's going to have him stacked differently. Sure. Um, but for me, I'm not going to have Leggett past seven. And I think he's going to be in heavy consideration to be a first-round pick by a lot of those teams in the mid to late 20s. Um, I know Buffalo is going to be in consideration for him. Obviously, Kansas City. You know, a lot of people have been looking at Leggett of like, oh, can we get him in the in the late second? If we get him in the early third, 
you're not. <laughs> you're, nope. ju- you're just not getting Leggett that late. And I know evaluators, when they've seen him in person, whether it was at the Senior Bowl, whether it was at the Combine, whether it was at the South Carolina Pro Day that just happened this week, again, he's another one of these guys where it you get great – context for what kind of athlete he is when you see him moving next to other future NFL athletes where you're like, oh my God, that's different. Like at his size, 220 pounds, for him to move the way he does, it it almost doesn't make sense. He's a better mover than Roma Dunze. And I say that knowing full well that Dunze is like an, an awesome athlete. Xavier Leggett's just different. And if you're looking at all of his like metrics just for this year, uh, one of the most impressive statistical profiles of any, anybody in this class, you know, 70 plus catches, 1200 plus yards, 14.2 average depth of target, really solid average. It wasn't just taking screens all day. Like they were throwing to him down the field, 33 explosive catches, uh, 45% contested catch rate, solid. It's not Rome, but it's solid. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you package that with also having a really solid yards after the catch per reception at 6.3, which is really, really good. Only two drops on the year. Like statistically speaking, he checks pretty much every single box. And then you watch him on film, and you're like, "Oh my god, he's running away from SEC defensive backs that all run four four, and he's pulling away." Like that's the kind of athlete he is. Um, you know, people discount his route running ability. I actually like him as a route runner. I think he's actually way underrated as a route runner. And so then you're kind of left with the one knock that people still have on him is like, yeah, but he's a one-year wonder. He's a late mm-hmm. breakout. Like, what do we do with this guy who was in college for five years and didn't do anything to the last year? That was the one question I really had to answer. And so when I went back and I was I was doing a lot of research into how that happened. Mm-hmm. And this is a story that I think is, is absolutely worth highlighting because I think it's it kind of more demonstrates resiliency than anything else. So uh, Leggett, when he was going through high school, um, he lost both of his parents by the time he was 17. Neither one of them, unfortunately, got to see him graduate. And, you know, that was 2018 is when he was graduating high school, uh, gray-shirted at South Carolina in 2019, and then COVID hit. And then a year after COVID hit, there was a coaching change. So not only did he have a lot going on in his life for a young kid to handle at the time. But then you're dealing with a pandemic and all, all the differences in practice schedules and how you develop as a young football player who, by the way, was a receiver in high school, then got converted to quarterback because they didn't have anybody else. And he was a running quarterback in high school and then converting him back to receiver. And he's trying to develop. He's trying to learn. You're dealing with a pandemic and then a coaching change. They were pretty much only using him on like swing screens the first few years of his career. He had a bunch of upperclassmen ahead of him. Just every everything kind of stacked against him. You know, he dealt with injuries coming off a motorcycle accident a couple of years ago. Like he just had so much happen to him over and over and over again that it it kind of made sense why there was a late breakout. Truly. And he could have transferred. He was a four-star athlete. He, he could have gone and played anywhere because uh, everybody knew what kind of athlete he was. But he didn't. He stayed. He wanted to develop. He wanted to grow. He wanted to earn his keep. He, you know, coaches praised his practice habits that you know, he, he really was investing in himself and trying to become a better player. And he did. And eventually, he won the starting job after kind of a brilliant performance in the bowl game the year before. Came back this year, won the starting job, and was one of the best receivers in the country. So, yes, there was a late breakout. Yes, it took five years to get going. But when you look at the circumstances that surrounded this kid growing up and in his college experience, I understand why it took a while. And if anything, I am just so impressed by him as a person to fight through everything that he went through, persevere, not give up, not quit, and become the kind of player he is now, that's the kind of guy I want to invest a first-round pick in. Somebody who's willing to work, somebody who's willing to get better, fight through adversity, and oh, by the way, he's phenomenally gifted. Who doesn't want that? So yeah, he's going to go first round. He should go first round. And if he ends up in Buffalo at like 28, you're telling me he's not going to be a damn good Buffalo Bill. Like, I believe in this kid. I really do. 
He's a great player. If you were paying attention, like you said, to college football at the end of last year, he kind of like put a note next to his name after bowl game. Bowl games, a lot going on there, but it was definitely a, I'm going to watch this next year and see how it goes. And there's a lot of nuance. I'm glad you dug into the backstory of get, but there's also a lot of nuance on the tape, right? And when you see a receiver with these kind of numbers, especially when they're playing with a high-profile quarterback, I go in with the question of, is the quarterback making the receiver better or is the receiver making the quarterback better? Where's that bias or balance lie? And obviously they have to work together. It's not one or the other. But in the case of Rattler and Leggett, like there are a lot of catches on Leggett's tape that a Rattler just like, well, <laughs> I'm just going to whip it up there and I know he can go win it. And he does. And that makes all those stats, the yak stats and the you know contested catch stats, and the ADOT stats, really impressive for Leggett. And largely, I would say the bias floats towards him over Rattler. This is not, you know, anti-Rattler propaganda. It is, man, he just saw him down there and whipped it up. It's not necessarily a good ball. It's, I'll give a guy a chance because I know he's exceptional and he's going to win. Early in the season, a couple of highlight catches and a couple of absolute blazing receptions on those long middle crossers where, again, he runs away from some of the fastest guys in the country. And I mean, dusts them, runs mm-hmm. away. So if you were paying attention by about week five in college football this year, you were like, ooh, Xavier really gets a dude. Like, I'm going to have to dig into all the nuance of his game, but like, there's enough there to work with. Let's see how high that's going to go. When you dig in, obviously, great frame, not as tall as South Carolina reported him, but extremely well built, um, fast as hell, strong hands. Like I said, like you said, I think route running is underrated. He's not the best route runner, but he is not a bad route runner by any stretch. Can win all over the field. I think he's a first rounder. I think he's got a more solid resume, even with the late breakout, than a lot of guys that have been talked up over him. And I hope the league sees it the same way because, yes, I want to see him paired with a quarterback with a very strong arm who's pretty accurate because he's going to pay that off in the pros on Sundays. And I'm going to enjoy watching it. And that's the definition of a gem. The hard part when trying to project where he's going to get drafted is – his tier of receivers is so loaded with like Crabbing. Lad McConkey, with uh, Keon Coleman. For people who are really into Ricky Pearsall, Tez Walker, Troy Frank, there's like six guys that are all kind of yep grouped together. I, I think he's going to be one of the first ones off the board in that tier, but we just don't know. Like we have, he could be wide receiver five, he could be wide receiver eight or nine. Like we we don't know, but I do know that. Whoever gets him is going to be very, very happy with the pick because he's he's awesome. Now, if you are also a Xavier Leggett truther like we are, uh, or if you're one of the millions and millions of people who look at Roman Dunze and you're like, oh, yeah, he's probably pretty good. Uh, or, you know, maybe down the board with some of the receivers we're going to talk about later in this show. If you follow the NFL draft and you also play way too much fantasy football like we do, Uh, and you would like to combine those two passions before these players even get drafted, you can draft them right now on Underdog Fantasy. Rookie Best Ball is live, and you can draft these guys before they even enter the league. At this point, you're basically just looking at the talent, and you're prioritizing taking good players over trying to analyze uh, you know, situations and depth charts and stuff like that, which to me is like a more pure version of fantasy football of just like, I don't know, draft good players and, and see what happens. You know, this time last year, Sam Laporta wasn't even being drafted. Puka wasn't even being drafted. A-Chan was like a 14th round pick, something like that. So if you're hot and heavy on either any of the big names or say you're like the biggest Luke McCaffrey fan ever, and you're like, you know, if he goes to Sean McVay, I think we can get a 1,000 yards out of that. Uh, whatever rookies you happen to love, you can draft them right now at Underdog Fantasy. Uh, you can use promo code BOOTLEG. They will match your deposit up to $100. So whatever you put in, whether it's 5, 10, 20, 100, they will double it. You can use it on Rookie Best Ball. Uh, you can save it for Best Ball Mania later this summer if you want to, because uh, the prize pool is always millions and millions and millions of dollars there uh or you can do nba pickums because nba pickums are still going on so whatever you happen to play they can double your deposit up to 100 bucks we want to thank underdog of course for sponsoring this episode and all of our draft coverage this year we have a lot more to go obviously and they'll be with us every step of the way 
Uh, now, EJ, speaking of other guys that are going to get drafted uh, very highly in rookie best ball, your second gem. Shocker, a first round talent. And you know me, I tend to shy away from these. I The one thing I don't necessarily love doing in gems is chalk. Like guys at the top of their respective positions because everybody's like, yeah, we know. This guy overcame that for me. Like last year I told you he was going to be on this list and nothing changed. And then, of course, I wavered. I was like, but, you know, everybody already knows about it. And I was like, I went back and watched him. It took... 90 seconds of tape to go nope he's a gem i'm putting him on there don't care (laughs) he qualifies he hits every definition of a gem and it's brock bowers and i'm gonna say weapon from georgia i i'm not gonna say tight end people are getting really hung up on the label i'm gonna go back to the football player and the football player is awesome it's the reason i'm wearing my walter payton shirt today walter payton was a hell of a football player he happened to be a great running back but he could also throw and kick and block and catch Brock Bowers is like that 10-year-old kid in Pee Wee League that's just the best athlete you have on the field that if you need a yard, you're giving it to him. Like, they needed a first down. They lined up Brock Bowers at fullback and said, we're giving it to you. Except he's doing it on Georgia in the (laughs) SEC. Like, Brock Bowers is the 10-year-old kid that's the best on the team, but he's doing it at Georgia. That's who Brock Bowers is. That's why he's not just a TE. Runs the ball out of several alignments. Has wide receiver-like production. He's just a game-breaker. And he is, you know, this year's production, people might look at it, 56 for 714 yards, 6 TDs, 12.8 per, 3 games over 100. That was in 10 games played because he had a bunch of games missed to injury. And for the games when he is healthy and on the field, which is most of his career at Georgia, if we're being honest, he is a difference maker. He is the guy that gets the ball. There's three guys with an angle on him. You're like, well, that's a nice reception. That's a 20-yard game, but he's not going to score. He scored. Like, how did he score? (laughs) How did that happen? Happens all the time on his tape. He's explosive. You talked about guys that move differently. Brock Bowers is one of the top five movers in this draft. Nobody moves like him. You just don't see tight ends, wide receivers, running backs move like Brock Bowers. He is a tremendously gifted athlete. Breaks tackles through a combination of shake and setting guys up and then burst. He'll lower his shoulder and run through him. I know there was some concern about his size with that weird picture of him versus Gronk remember folks you all thought I had an NFL wingspan when I stood in front of a tackle (laughs) I am not that big Brock Bowers is fine his mom posted a picture after that yay mom gotta love football moms that come to the rescue and we're like no this is what he actually looks like that was a bad perspective he's plenty well built in terms of size and uses that size very very well which is I think actually more important just so coordinated like some guys are tough and strong like you see him just like leap over guys like on his back lay the football out over and then land on his feet and walk away and hand it to the ref and yeah it it's like, like it's like most, reggie bush type acrobatics but a you're tight just end. like people like most people can't do that even most people on this which is an sec football field Don't come close to that. He just looks different even against all of those guys. So tremendous balance. Um, Regularly, I love the fact that he just lowers his shoulder and engages defenders because it's like, I'm going to take a hit. I'm going to give them one too. And that's just one of my favorite qualities of a football player. Um, Runs with real power. Again, they run him out of the backfield. They've run him in the fullback set. They've run him in the halfback set. They've run him on you know, tap passes, you know, jet sweeps. Again, they just want to get the ball in his hand, and he is a powerful and gifted runner. He will just as soon juke you, cut past you, and, you know, out out accelerate you as lower the shoulder on a defensive back who's not as big, drive him into the ground, and then go another 18 yards and score. Um, Serious yak and, you know, catch and contact threat. At one point, this is one of the most ridiculous stats in the draft. At one point this year, 80% 80% of his yards were yak yards. See, I believe it because if you're looking at <laughs> if you're looking at Malachi Corley, right, who a lot of people mm-hmm. see as the best yak threat in this class, 8.5 yards after catch per reception for Malachi Corley. Bowers was at 8.1. <laughs> and he's like 25 pounds heavier. Yep. Like he's insane in terms of yards after catch threats. He's nuts. I mean, he's fast. He can break 
DB angles with speed or power and run him over. Again, we talked about that acrobatic. His stop start is tremendous. He just leave guys sort of gaping, breaks a lot of ankles. Very good and quick at the stem, can win either way in terms of a route runner. Just like, again, like Rome, you look at him and you go, what is he not good at? And you might say, oh, well, power inline blocking. No, he's not great at that. He's a solid blocker. He's a try-hard guy. He's going to get in the way. He, you know, he can definitely move smaller guys. Is he a great inline blocker against defensive ends or tackles? He's not. Other than that, if that's how you're using him, you're misusing him, let's be honest. And for what he can bring your football team in every other way as an offensive threat, Brock Bowers is one of the top five football players in this draft on the offensive side of the football, period. How I approach Bowers, and and I I have to I have to be delicate with this because <laughs> people see me as like a Bowers hater. And it's like oh. I'm not a Bowers hater. I'm a Bowers realist hmm. because when people say he's a generational tight end, I'm like, no, he's not. Because hmm. a generational tight end can do all the traditional Y tight end stuff: line up on the line of scrimmage, dig out a six technique by yourself, like you know, be left one-on-one against an edge and pass for like all the Rob Gronkowski stuff, all the mm-hmm. George Kittle stuff. That's a generational tight end. Bowers isn't that. You know what Bowers is? He's generational H-back. Correct. That's what he is. He's the best H-back since Kyle Juszczyk, who's mm-hmm. made eight straight Pro Bowls, came in the league 10 years ago. But when Juszczyk really started going – you know, again, almost a decade ago now where every single year it's just like, he's the best. Uh, Bowers is the best one to come into the league in that archetype since Juszczyk kind of rose to prominence, right? Um, pretty much the same size, 235, 235. That's what Bowers played at, mid-230s. And you use him the same as Kyle Juszczyk. You don't, you don't put Kyle Juszczyk in a line of scrimmage and say, hey, go dig out that defensive end. That's not what he does. That's what George does. Kyle... He's in the slot. He's in the backfield. You're moving him around. If you if you want to use him on double teams, he's an asset on double teams, but you're not leaving him one-on-one against a big defensive end. Um, if you want him blocking in space, he's great at that because he'll bury a, a, a defensive back. Uh, if you want him, you know, cutting off the backside edge on like a sift block where the angles are more favorable and it's not about power it's more so about angles and just kind of getting yourself in the right spot he'll absolutely do that all the kyle use check stuff he does really really well he's just a better receiver than kyle use check who is a pretty good receiver but bowers is just on a different level so it's like if you're getting kyle use check with way more yak skills yeah that's a first round pick and you're laughing your way to the bank, and you're feeling great about that because he's going to play forever if he's used like that. I just push back on generational tight end because I'm like, that's not the position he plays. He he's an H back, you know. He it's it's just it's not the same. And I want people to kind of differentiate the two roles. He he would not play the same role as George Kittle. He just wouldn't. But it doesn't mean that he wouldn't be a phenomenal football player. I think he's awesome. I love him. He's going to be a top twenty pick. I just think the label he's been given is not fair, not by you. I'm talking about by other people. No, and, and that's why I put weapon is because people yeah. get really hung up on tight end for lots of different reasons, kind of up and down, right? And they say, oh, he's the best tight end. He's not a good tight end because of this or that. Like, I don't care. I want to wipe all that stuff out. And I realize that it has, you know, real meaning in terms of where you can draft him and his slot has real meaning in terms of draft contract value. I I get all that. I'm, I'm brushing that to the side right now and looking at Brock Bowers, the football player, if he can do everything Kyle Juszczyk can do in, in the sort of other game and he's a weapon, you know, on the level of, I would say he's, you know, yeah, I don't want to make comparisons, but like use check except if you threw to use check like nine times a game which you should yeah. be doing but you should you be doing that anyway because, but, yeah. <laughs> because you know but when use check gets the ball he is dynamic and brock bowers is better than that so if you're getting all that stuff at baseline in terms of formation versatility blocking help um a creative coach is going to be able to break defenses with brock bowers 
because you can put him anywhere and ask him to do almost anything outside of the heavy duty blocking stuff that we've talked about. And so you're going to have to try and account for him. And I got news for you, folks. There's nobody on your defense that can account for him. I think uh, if if the Ravens get him, which it would be such a Ravens pick, um, <laughs> you're going to see like Bowers. They're going to run some weird wildcat shit with like Bowers, Henry, and Lamar. And DCs are just going to throw their hands up and be like, whatever, dude. Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a great Fuck football you. player. He's super, he's super fun. Yeah, they'll be saying a lot of that no matter who plays against Brock Bowers. Because trying to tackle him is no fun. Trying to catch him is no fun. Uh, trying to stay with him on routes for a lot of defenders is no fun. And and you get to that classic conundrum. He, he creates a mismatch because if you have somebody that can stay with him on breaks, they're typically not big enough to deal with his power. And if you have somebody that's big enough to deal with his power, they can't stay with him on breaks. So he's he's going to win either way. Uh, my second gem, um, another receiver, just because there's so many receivers in this class, but one that isn't talked about uh, as much as as the top couple tiers. He's gotten a lot of love on on Twitter lately, and you know Steve Smith Sr., uh, who's been doing great work on this receiver class, has highlighted him as well. Uh, that's Javon Baker from UCF. Now, former Alabama receiver. Transferred after 2021, came to UCF in 2022. And after watching Javon Baker, uh, his UCF tape, uh, I was left wondering how the hell did Bama let him walk out the door? Because he's better Mm -hmm. than everybody Bama's had the last two years. Like, he's just straight up better than all of them. Uh, 17.9 average depth of target. Like, he is a deep, deep threat. Uh, Great size, six foot, 200 pounds. So not only like he's not one of these deep threats where it's like a stiff breeze is going to carry him away. Like he's got size. He's got deep speed, tracks the ball really well, really smooth route runner, 30 explosive catches last year, which is a lot. He did have a few drops, but when you're factoring in the routes he was running again, way far down the field, his average target was a lot more difficult than guys who were just living off of like screens all day and slants and stuff like yeah you're gonna have drops when your average depth of target is almost 20 yards down the field so that didn't really cause much concern for me um i just look at somebody who's as smooth as he is um as tough as he is great tracker of the deep ball like i i see a future high-end like complimentary receiver in almost like the like the most new kind of, or uh, uh, God, who who was oh man? He played forever. He's in the Lions, the Jacksonville, the Lions again. Uh, Marvin Jones, mm-hmm. like that that kind of role where it's like, is he ever going to be a number one? Probably no. But boy, he'd be a really good number two. And I think there's a lot of teams that would love to have Javon Baker as like their third level threat that can work down the field, be reliable. Uh, and also be able to take a hit just because you know 200 pounds is tends to be a lot more durable than the guys that are coming in at like buck 70 these days. Super explosive player. First thing when I watched him that really stood out, started with his UCF tape, then went back to his Alabama tape. But on the UCF tape, you see so much explosion. And I don't mean explosive plays. Like explosive plays are the result. But as an athlete, he's just wild. Like... He has wild, super exaggerated movements, really sharp cuts, explosive jumps. He can explode up and climb the ladder, go get the ball. Um, Burst is explosive. Like He's just a wild, explosive athlete. Is he the most refined guy? No, he has some drops, and you're going to see that wildness sort of translate to the rest of his game, but it's like one of those horses, right? He's like, He's fast. (laughs) Can I ride him? I'm like, "Mm, maybe. I don't know. He bites. Uh, But, you know, he bites defenses. And that's what you just see that they have a lot of respect for all that athletic ability. And his ability to hurt them deep in one place scares a lot of people. And he lives off it. He, He furthers that reputation. He backs that up. 
And like you said, it's surprising. He's better than a lot of the Alabama receivers who've been in that room for the last couple of years. And I love your sort of slot role for him as a number two. People trying to project him as an you know eventual alpha. He's got a ways to go before he yeah. gets there. It, it's just not that roundness of a skill set that you look at. But there's a lot of skills and you can use what's there and they're valuable in the NFL. So he is going to get drafted. He is going to be one of the receivers, I think, that in this very deep class gets drafted fairly early. And some people who haven't paid attention are going to be like, who? Like, where? What's cool? Like, why do I not know about this guy? And they're going to learn real quick, especially if he lands in a decent passing attack in the role you're talking about as a complimentary outside receiver who can threaten defenses on any particular play with that combination of size, speed, and sort of explosive wild playmaking. That is, that's a threat to DCs. They don't like that. They would much rather have somebody, you know, who's a little bit more predictable over there. Uh, he's going to have a place in the NFL. He's a fun player. I think he could go late round two. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really, really do. Because a lot of the teams that are going to be picking in that in that range might be looking for that exact skill set. You mm-hmm. know, Kansas City, if they don't go receiver round one, which they probably will, but let's say there's just not anybody there that they've really fallen in love with. Uh, they're obviously a trade back candidate because somebody's going to want to come up for a f- come up for a fifth year option. Um, you know, they could be looking at at back around too and be like, "We don't need a one, but we do need a deep threat number two. Uh, sure. like, like he he's their exact fit. So I think he's going to go back into round two just because he's very, very, very good as a complimentary threat. And to be honest, he might be better in that role than Tez Walker. Like he he might be better in that role than than Troy Franklin. I mean, he's bigger than Troy Franklin. Uh, he's got the same vertical juice as Troy Franklin. I like he he might go ahead of quite a few other receivers in this class that have gotten a lot more publicity. I would not be shocked. So keep your eye on Javon Baker. Uh, moving on to third round of gems here. Who's your number three? I'm going to go with Trey Benson, the running back from Florida State. And a lot of people are going to say, hey, he's the top running back. You already picked like the top receiver in the top 10. He's not the top running back for a lot of people. Um, I, he's the top running back for me, but uh, I would not say he is anywhere near consensus chalk as the top running back in the NFL. Regardless, he's stupid talented. Started his career at Oregon, ended up at Florida State. Um 138 rushes, 838 yards, 14 touchdowns on the ground, um, 6.1 per. Like that's that's pretty solid given the you know the competition he was playing against. Just watching him play though, again, a lot of the things we just said about Javon Baker translate to Trey Benson at a different size. Very quick feet, he stays over them, doesn't overextend, picks his way through the middle, which surprised me. You know, he's a very crafty runner through the middle. I didn't necessarily expect to see that from his tape, but it's definitely there. And the thing that makes Trey one of my favorite players to watch in this draft is the first cut or move is so quick, and mm-hmm. then it's backed up with that 4-3 speed. And that translates on tape very well. Some guy's track speed does not translate to pads. For him, it does. He is decisive. That move happens like that. And then he is on the gas. And people are like, oh, crap. (laughs) Like, we missed. And he's already in the second level and pressing or breaking angles in the third level. And that combination just makes him electric as a runner. Really, really deadly. Gets up to speed very quickly and kind of just keeps accelerating. He's one of those guys that as you watch him, he doesn't top out. There is, you know, he does not lack a fifth gear he just keeps rolling and it's like oh i thought that you know one of those corners was gonna catch him nope they're not and that's what i found interesting about him is like he's he's what two it's 220 i think was yeah. was his listed size and you, yeah. when you look at the measurements before you watch him you're going into it and you're like okay he's he's probably gonna be like really good in the first 20 yards and then he's gonna gas <laughs> out because most guys his size do and then you watch them along runs you're like Oh, he's just, he just keeps going. He, he just enters like that, again, like you said, the fifth <laughs> gear, and like you're expecting him to eventually flatline. And I swear to God, on a 60-yard run, he's still accelerating by the time he gets to the end zone. It's like, oh, he just doesn't stop ever. I was going to pick plays to highlight this. This is the most Trey Benson thing ever. So if you want to see examples of this, watch his 
first and third touchdowns against Southern Miss and both scores against Virginia Tech. Yeah. <laughs> no, it just those, he never stops accelerating, ever. Those four touchdowns in two games will tell you all you need to know, along with the fact that he scored four touchdowns in two games. Um, third best athleticism score uh, at the Combine for running backs, and that's an overall score. You get so much extra at the second and third levels because, again, the decisiveness, and then he puts the hammer down, things break, and he's got size. You add in that tackle-breaking ability, and he just really becomes complete. It's like, well, if we get a defensive back over there, which we might not because of the speed, he'll bring him down. Oh, no, he's 220. They might bounce off, and he's still going 60 yards. So when you take in that sort of really good pre-snap vision, decisive first mover cut that's very very sharp he does not round things off and then he can gun it at 220 you talk about defensive coordinators throwing their hands up and going what the hell are we supposed to do against this guy and pretty much everybody he played against this year did that also a pretty good receiver caught 20 balls for 227 yards so he's got some experience in the passing game with his speed he is valuable down the field he is not just a screen receiver because look he runs a slant and go or a wheel route where he kind of blocks and then goes out on the wheel a little chip wheel like super dangerous playmaker keeps that speed keeps defenses under just constant pressure and he also knows how to vary it which is the piece that just made my jaw hit the floor i was like most guys that are that fast once they hit it they just gun it like they're i'm i'm faster than you i'm bigger than you and you would fully expect that from a player like trey benson he'll get down the field stutter step pony kick and then guys are just like whatever man <laughs> you got moves you got size you got four three speed and now you're throwing this at me 25 yards down the field what the hell do you want me to do and i don't really have a good answer that's why trey benson's my third gem i'm really struggling to find a comp for him because it's like how many two Again, he lost a little bit of weight for the combine to run faster. He played at 220. I'm like, how many 220 pound running backs run 4 4 flat? Like, I, I, I'm really struggling to find another, another player like him, right? Uh, that also has as good a feet as him because he's got, especially when they're running all that shotgun counter stuff, which is how he got a lot of his explosive runs is they just ran counter over and over and over again. He's like, well, it keeps working. <laughs> We're just going to keep doing it. And it's like, we, we trust Trey to get to that hole. And then once he hits it, he's gone. Um, it, and I just, I, I don't know who to compare him to because it's such a unique physical profile. Like if you're looking at RAS, I want to say, uh, there we go. I just pulled it up right now. Nine seven eight RAS, which is the fortieth ranked running back in athleticism score out of almost eighteen hundred. Yeah, going back to nineteen eighty seven. And the only reason why he's not a ten, honestly, is because his vert was only thirty three and a half, which was yeah. not as much as a lot of other running backs who were putting up like thirty seven, thirty eight. But again, four three nine at six foot two sixteen ten two in the broad crazy 10 yard splits like a one five four ten yard split like all the stuff that actually matters yeah. is is legit like top 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 tier athleticism he's just a hard guy to find a comp for um i think well i don't i don't know yet because i haven't actually ordered these running backs yet but i think if trey benson goes to the right spot he might outproduce everybody else like truly, like more than Brooks, more than Lloyd, because uh, his his physical potential is better than everybody else. Like it really is. He is he is a very we don't use this word lightly. Unique. He is a unique athletic profile. He's very difficult to deal with from a defensive standpoint. And one of the my favorite things about that is that he fits the modern NFL run game very, very well. And by that, I mean he does not need a lot of carries to make a ton of impact. And he can split them between carry and catch. He's not one of those you know, running backs that you need to get quote-unquote lathered up because nobody gets lathered up in the NFL anymore. You get mm -hmm. 10 or 12 touches. And on any of those 10 or 12 touches – he can make an explosive run play. This is a guy that can game break anytime, doesn't need 15 carries to get in the groove, can take it inside, outside, like you said, on all those cutback runs. It really didn't matter how the blocking worked out because he can pick his way through the middle and break it. Oh, he can also outrun you to the edge if you seal. Like, 
he is just capable with every touch you give him. And that's really valuable because if you get a lot of college running backs, they need 15, 20 carries to kind of get in the groove and then they're going to break one and that's how they're going to get their average. That doesn't typically translate to the NFL. Now, my next gem, we're keeping it with this running back class because I, I want to have a, a discussion where we kind of directly compare Marshawn Lloyd to him. Mm. Um, Marshawn Lloyd is similar kind of style or similar kind of size, I should say. Stylistically, it's a little bit different. Um, but if we're just looking at size, again, like 5'9", 220, built like a human bowling ball. Uh, <laughs> but again, great speed, legit, you know, high 4'4 speed. And I think he's got even better feet than Benson. Like Benson has good, good, good feet. Mm-hmm. Marshawn Lloyd has tremendous feet in terms of start-stop ability, uh, in terms of the ability to just change angles on a dime and yep. you know put one foot in the ground, open up the opposite hip, and then immediately like he's he's hitting a ninety-degree angle. It's it's not um, Shady McCoy, <laughs> but it's not that far off. (laughs) Like he's got tremendous feet, especially for his size. Very few guys that are 220 uh, can, can change direction like that. Now being so low to the ground at five, nine probably helps a little bit because taller running backs tend to not have good COD. Shorter running backs do tend to have good COD, but the fact that he has that change of direction ability with four, four speed and he's packing 220, like He's just really tough to handle because you're never going to get a good angle on him when you're trying to tackle him and you're trying to tackle 220 with a bad angle because he's going to get to his spot before you can get to that spot. And his feet are so good that he can just kind of give you worse angles as he's reading you down. Like there's some there's some runs where he's getting to the edge and he's reading your angle. And then he's just going to like while he's full speed, he's just going to change five to 10 degrees where he's like, I'm going to give you a, a slightly smaller target here. And I know you're going to miss because I'm doing that. Uh, he's just so, so agile packaging together with that speed and power. And he's a good receiver and he's got good vision. Again, I don't know who's going to be my RB1 in this class because they're right next to each other. And you're kind of looking for different things. Like Benson, you're looking for just sheer tear your face off explosiveness and long speed. Marshawn Lloyd, I think you're you're looking for more of a, uh, you know, I comped him to like Michael Turner, where it's like, how mm-hmm. is that bowling ball moving so quickly? Like that, that kind of guy where it's, I think Marshawn Lloyd under 20 yards is the better back. I think Trey Benson... 20 and up is the better back and it really just kind of depends on what you're looking for here um but either way they're both going to go probably right next to each other because i think they're really really similar in terms of overall grade but just slightly different players this is the best day of the year because i get to dig into running back (laughs) minutia because these are two very similar players but i do see them differently uh You know, Marshawn Lloyd, high need runner who really blasts into his cuts. He's a forceful dude. He he runs hard into his cuts. Um, Good long speed for size, as you mentioned. Good size. I actually don't think he's as good through contact as some other backs of his size in this class. He's good at it, but I expected him to be better at that really compact size with his speed. You talked about his feet, and really now we get to sort of bring out the protractor and talk about like where running backs are good with their feet. He is very good with his feet. He's really good, especially coming at you in what I would say is a more narrow cone. His stop start is not great. He is not a jitterbug. He's not the guy that for the most part is going to like, you know, come to a complete stop, turn you around full field reversal and go the other way. See, and that's where I that's disagree. Not his style. I, I do think he does. I, I do think he has that. He does some of that. He's not fast at it. Like his ability to throttle all the way down and go the other way. But where you were talking about his feet being good is absolutely true. Coming at you in a cone at full speed, 30 degree angle, his ability to like shake you down and either take half of you and run through you or make you miss completely again keeping speed and making those cuts at speed again moving sort of towards you is at the top of this class like he makes more people look silly doing that 
because he is so fast and he does have very good feet. It is not the kind of, I think a lot of people get hung up on, and this is like the wide receiver drills at all-star games, right? People get hung up on all the stuff people do. It's like, that's not going to be like the kind of running Marshawn Lloyd does translates very well to the NFL. I'm going to get going. I'm going to generally be in this half of the field. And I mean, generally, because the other thing that I really like about Lloyd is his ability to do that two or three times within one run to maximize everything he's getting out of the carry is better. A lot of backs who have his ability to do that will do it once. And then, like I said, just kind of gun it and see how far they can outrun people. He'll do it, get to the next defender, do it again, get to the next defender and do it again. And that makes for some tremendous production, really good athlete, very similar, like you said, in a lot of ways to Benson. And when you really start picking apart the hows of their different, it's, Stuff I love talking about. I get to nerd out on running back play. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to send you some clips later tonight. Get you nice and I, Marshawn Lloyd pilled before you go to bed. I, it's fine. <laughs> I, I'm already pilled. Like pe- people might think you're a Brock Bowers hater. They're going to come out of this and say, "Oh, you said Marshawn Lloyd's not good." No, I just said he's excellent at the top of the class in several of these categories and a really good player. Super fun to watch, and I love doing this stuff. I love saying, hey, so we have two great players here, whether it's two wide receivers, two tight ends, or in this case, two running backs, and going, what are the differences? And it's really going to come down to the eye of the beholder. There are absolutely teams that are going to have Marshawn Lloyd ranked higher than Benson, and there are absolutely teams that are going to have Benson ranked higher than Lloyd, and it's because of their particular run scheme or their preferences for what they like in a running back. But they're not really going to go wrong with either one of them. They're both really, really good players, and they're both going to be some of the first running backs off the board in this draft. Then there's going to be teams that have Brooks ranked over both of them. Yep, 100%. <laughs> so, so again, when people we are saying, oh, <laughs> you pick Chalk, Benson's number one. He might be number one on your board. I guarantee he's not number one on everybody's board because this is not a draft where I think anyone – is number one on everybody's board. There's just not that back in this draft. Somewhere Kyle Shanahan's just be like, bring me Isaac Garendo. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody's got their thing, don't they? Uh, bring me the slasher from Louisville. Yes. Uh, all right, your number four, Jim, who you got? Uh, this is one of my favorites of the entire year, and I think it's going to be one of my favorites of offense or defense of any of the players we get to meet. Uh, Mason McCormick, interior offensive line from South Dakota State. Um, I'm going to say this with all the love in the world. He is just such an old lineman. And that is meant as the highest compliment I could possibly give you, Mace. Um, great build, 6'4", 309. And then it just so happens he goes to the combine and he's an elite athlete. And I'm talking like an Olympic level athlete. His 996 RAS ranked him seventh out of 1,445 eligible guards since 1987. Seventh. This guy is a top 10 guard, period. Um, his shuttle score, 445, is below the Magic Josh Norris line of 447. That line, for those of you that don't know, 24 of the 28 offensive linemen with that mark who've been drafted since 2010 went on to start 84% of their games. Um, it's just kind of a cheat code. If they have that shuttle, they play a long time in the NFL. Do believe Mason's going to play a long time in the NFL. Six years of experience. He's already played a lot of football. He's played a ton of football. When we got to talk to him at Shrine Bowl, it was very, very clear that he well understood what defenses were trying to do to him, um, and there was very little he hadn't seen. Now that's going to accelerate when he gets to the league because all the exotics are going to come out of the closet in terms of blitzes. But if I'm confident in somebody's ability to basically take all the experience he has and translate that very quickly, Mason would be at the top of the list. Only gave up three pressures this year. A lot of Mason McCormick tape. You're looking at a mall guys absolutely finish on the end of runs, drive him into the turf, and you think, oh, okay, he's a big mauling run blocking guard. But how is he in pass pro? <laughs> he gave up three pressures this year, and they're all hurries. No hits, mm-hmm. no sacks, clean sheet. Nobody touched his quarterback. Um, love that about him. Nice guy off the field. Very nice guy nasty and bullish on it in the best possible way but the coolest thing about that that again this is something that you pick up when you get to you know hang around and watch a player up close just keeps a smiling and calm demeanor through all of it he's one of the quiet ones that you really have to worry about yeah (laughs) somebody got in his face second day of shrine bowl practice kind of pushed his helmet back there's a little chest to chest and i was in a position to be able to see the look on his face and he was like hey man If you want to, like, have at it. Never raised his hands, never backed off, just kind of was like, 
sure, if you want to go there, it's kind of chuckling the whole time. He's just got that Jack Reacher energy of like, you you really don't want like, to do this. If you decide, <laughs> I'm happy to go there. And I talked to him about it. I said, hey, man, that guy was up in your grill. He was getting in you. You're just like, eh, that's all right. He kind of looked at me, smiled. He went, yeah. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> like that's Mason in a nutshell. Um, called protections from his guard alignment at Sand at uh, South Dakota State, and this is notable. Most guards do not call protections. That's center. It's notable because Mason picked up snapping at the Shrine Bowl. Looked pretty good doing it. And the biggest leap for guards moving to center, or one of the biggest leaps mentally, is to then to take on all the protections. He's literally already done it. His center was more junior than him on the line, so he called protections until the center was up to speed. He's already done it. I asked him if he likes to play center. He said he loves it. Some guys just don't like that extra responsibility. They just want to stay at guard and kick people's asses. He's good going either way. So when you add it all up, tons of experience, great physical profile, elite athleticism, already very good in pass pro, and the versatility to play any of the three interior offensive line positions – Mace McCormick is going to get drafted before you think he is. I'm just going to tell you that. No matter where you think he's going to get drafted, he's going to go before that. Teams are going to love the player, the production, the physical profile, the outlook. Interior offensive linemen as a category are one of the safest projections early on in the draft in terms of hit rate. And a guy like Mason McCormick, he's like Rome. He just does everything well. Great, great player. I, one of the first players that's going to get drafted and people are going to go, who? And then three years from now, they're going to be like, I don't know, it looks pretty good now. He's, he's a very solid player. This is going to sound kind of early to a lot of people, as you, as you said, but once we get to Miami in the second round, uh, which they're at pick 55, that's where I think we start looking at Mason, right? Because their starting center at the moment is slated to be Aaron Brewer, um, you still got Lester Cotton at left guard. You got Robert Jones at right guard. I, he would be their starting center, but he could challenge for a guard spot, truly. Uh, and obviously, he's athletic enough to not only survive, but thrive in a Mike McDaniel offense. Uh, I think Dallas, one pick later at 56, could look at him. Um, boy, I think, does he not fit Detroit at 61? Do they need him? Not necessarily, but I mean, kind of, right. but like he just, he, he so fits Dan Campbell and what Dan Campbell likes, just nasty, gritty, uh, I technically sound powerful. Like there's just not a, there's not a lot to dislike about Mason. If you like football, right? He's yeah. good at it. He's smart about it. He's, physically well built his experience like he's going to fit a variety of systems because of that athleticism i'm with you that you know last year our guy from the shrine bowl was juice scruggs we loved juice scruggs and we were like man i think he could go like top of the fourth round and he went second round yeah, yeah. to the texans and played really well as a rookie moved from center to guard and and acquitted himself very very well i think mason mccormick for all that like we're already thinking Top 100 for sure, but I'm with you. It's going to be more like between 50 and 70. But if you get to 70 and Mason McCormick's not off the board yet, you're going to be like any pick now. Like it's happening in the next three picks. Uh, or 75. Uh, <laughs> cough, cough, Chicago. <laughs> like, yeah. I know they signed Colton Shellman. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> really tell don't me. Care. I would I would love that. And and with their particular, I wasn't going to bring it up because it was, oh, you're always talking about Chicago. Well, yeah, I'm going to talk about Chicago again because, look, they've lost so much in the past couple of years to their interior offensive line falling apart, their center not being great, their guards getting hurt. Like, Mason just sort of ensures all that. He's one of your best five. You pick whatever spot. He's not going to be a diva about it. They're going to be like, oh, we're going to put you at right guard. He's like, fine. We're, we're going to put you at center because, you know, Coleman got dinged up. Okay. Like, he's just going to go out there. And, like, you're going to look at the tape and you're going to be like, God, I don't know. I have, like, eight positively graded plays and, like, one maybe negative. Everything else was just he did his job. Like, okay. Like, that's just the kind of player he is. So he would be a tremendously valuable for so many teams, but certainly for Chicago. I honestly, I don't think he'll be on the board at 75. He like, should I really be. don't. He shouldn't be. He's one of the six, maybe seven at most 
guards in this class or top six to seven guards in this class. You could argue he's a top five guard in this class. Um, and he's a top three center. If he converts to center, he's a top three center. I'd, I'd put him right behind Frazier, truly. Like, mm-hmm. that's that's how good, especially just watching, watching him do the drill work when he was – at Shrine where they put him at center for a day just to see if he could do it. And he was the best one. <laughs> like out of yeah. out of all like the actual true centers. Like he was better than all of them when he when he did that switch. Um yeah, he's he's gonna go high. Uh my fourth offensive gen, keeping it with the offensive line. Uh it's my turn to do a chalk pick. Troy Fatanu. Uh offensive line extraordinaire from Washington. A lot of people think he's a guard. Most people think he's a tackle. My answer is yes. Like, yes, he's he's whatever you want him to be. I personally think that he's going to play tackle in the NFL because he has the quickness for it. He obviously has the length for it, 34-plus-inch arms, uh, which is kind of the, the threshold that a lot of teams look for. It's like, hey, if you get if you got 34 as your starting number, we're in business, and he does. I understand at 6'3 and a half, a lot of people think that a tackle has to be 6'6". Six, six. Not really. It's just most tackles are 6'6 six, six because the 6'6 six, six, six guys tend to have the longer <laughs> arms. But if you have the longer <laughs> arms in a shorter frame, that means that it's harder to get a leverage advantage on him and he's got length on you. So as far as I'm concerned, he's actually kind of the ideal frame for a tackle. Somebody who's not going to get out leveraged and is going to land his punches and, oh, by the way, He's a freak athlete that can get to his landmarks quicker than most edges can get to theirs. So he's going to beat you to the corner, and then you got to deal with not just length, but uh, well-drilled length. And by that, I mean he's got every move you can think of in terms of flashing the inside hand, flashing the outside hand. He'll come in with a two-handed punch. He'll come in wide. He'll come in low. Like, he attacks you from all these different angles. As a tackle, he's never going to give you the same set too much. He's got a vertical set. He's got a jump set. He's got an angle set. And he'll use his hands independently in a whole bunch of different ways. Like, you never really know what you're going to get from him in pass pro. He's got a wicked cut block as well when they're in quick game. Um, He's just a really hard tackle to prepare for. You know, you compare him to... uh, some other highly drafted tackles like say Charles Cross where it's like we got two sets we got a jump set we got a vertical set and he's using his hands the same way every single time so once you figure out that where his outside foot is you can tell what set he's going to give you and then you know exactly where his hands are going to be because he's going to give you the same hands every time you can plan against Charles Cross and you can you can kick his ass pretty easily by by the second half once you figure out how to read him you're never going to figure out how to read Choi Fatanu because he uses his hands differently every time and he uses his feet differently every time. Uh, he's just so, so hard to prepare for on top of the physical attributes of having length and a leverage advantage. I just think he's one of the best tackles in this class, one of the four best tackles in this class. And as far as who's going to be a good NFL player, he might end up being a better NFL tackle than guys that go ahead of him that are more uh, higher profile, I guess you could say. Like, Sure. Once he and Fawaga and Olu and Alt get in the league, like, wouldn't be surprised if Adonu ends up being the best of the bunch. Like, he's... I, I just can't really find a weakness. I really can't find a weakness. He's great in space. He's great as a run blocker. He's great in pass protection. Leader in the locker room. Very experienced. Like, what... What do you want? Like he's got all of it. Like I, if he goes beyond pick fifteen, you know, and I, Colts wouldn't take him at, at fifteen. They would, they would trade. But like, he's one of the fifteen best players in this class. He should go in the top fifteen. If he goes past that, like God, if he makes it to the Rams at like nineteen, are you kidding me? They would be doing backflips. They they would be besides. They wouldn't believe it. Because he's just that good. Like, I love Fatanu. Even if he's the fourth tackle off the board, he could very well be the best tackle in this class once they all get to the league. Like, I think he's that good. He has a lot of things to bet on. The only thing he doesn't have is height. And like you, that does not worry me because he has so many other tools. The mental tools, the physical tools, 
the experience, the athleticism. He's a former volleyball player. He just quit playing volleyball because he got too big. So he started playing <laughs> football. Like, But you can see that athleticism. When I talk about Brock Bowers moving differently, like Troy Fatano moves differently. You see him on the field, you're like, dude, that's not – like he could play tight end. He absolutely could, you know, drop a little bit of weight, play tight end, and he'd be awesome at it. He's that kind of versatile athlete. He's got the dimensions. He's got the power. He's very experienced. He's very smart, as you said. He's versatile. He can play inside, like you said, play inside, play tackle. I think he, you start him at tackle because of that ability in space. He really can move. You said get to his landmarks before those guys vary the hand uses. He's got a punch. Love the aggressive little, like, both short sets in pass pro and then when he fires out to do that cut block and occasionally he's going to he's going to get on an RPO team or a team that uses some RPOs and he's going to be like coach can I just go kill this guy or can I make it look like run because he'll he's not going to get anywhere near your passer in the time that he needs to throw so can I just fire out on this one and like waste this guy so that he's just like now what like <laughs> i've already gotten the full bag from this guy and now he's just punching me in the chest you know that that two-hand bag drill they do they were doing that at uh, oregon the other day where they you know basically tackles on his knees and he has to fire out hit the bag and like stretch out yeah like can i just do that to him one rep so he has no idea what i'm gonna do next and coach would be like yeah sure i know you'll hit him so yeah fod tonning super fun player Really good athlete. I think he is going to be one of the safer tackles up at the top because he's already there, and already there is really good. It's not one of those guys you're like, well, he's topped out physically. He's topped out mentally. I don't feel like that. I feel like he's just adaptable, very versatile, uh, physically gifted, goes to a good coaching staff, can fill pretty much any role they throw at him, and is going to be an asset like immediately. If you said... Who's going to start well, like right out of the gate? Fadtana would be way up near the top of my list for players in this draft. 945 RAS. And the only reason it's a 945 and not like height. a 98 is, is yeah. height. He's got height, everything. Else. 100%. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get to our fifth and final gems for both of us. Uh, this next name is going to be a familiar one to people who have followed our draft coverage a lot so far, but. We couldn't do this whole episode without one of us bringing him up, so of course we did. EJ, who's your fifth gem? Malik Washington, wide receiver, West Virginia. The fifth spot is always tough for me in gems. You know me in lists. I debate. I go back and forth. I move guys on. I take guys off. Even this morning, I was back. I was like, all right, I have Malik Washington, and I have one other wide receiver. It was Ricky Pearsall. He's in my honorable mentions list, so you hear that in a second, but I went back and just head to head. All right, which one? I like them both a lot more down the board receivers. I always pick one. Last year it was Josh Downs. Again, guy I wanted to throw off the list, just couldn't do it. Watched Ricky Pearsall and Malik back to back, and I was like, it's Malik. Like, love both those players. I think they're both going to be really good values. They're both going to be successful pros. They're a little bit different in terms of alignment profile, but as an overall football player who is just fun to watch, Malik Washington. Wide receiver, Virginia. Started out at Northwestern. I'm going to give you some names in this draft. Keon Coleman, Johnny Wilson, Tez Walker, Jamari Thrash, Bub Means. All wide receivers who are getting significant buzz in this year's draft cycle. You know who outproduced all those guys? Malik Washington. <laughs> Malik Washington, that's right. He was the leading receiver in the ACC. Uh, 1,426 yards on 110 catches. 13 yards per catch, 9 TDs. <laughs> the rest of these stats are also equally ridiculous. Uh, yak per reception is 6.4 yards. <laughs> yards per route run is 3.15. A lot of people aren't familiar with yards per route run. 3.15, very good mark. A dot is 8.1, averaged up the target. So he's not just a screen guy in Yak, although he did line up primarily in the slot. Again, like Fa'atanu, the only thing he really doesn't have is height. He is compactly built. He's built like a running back. He runs like a running back. He's got very good hands. Drop rate is only 2.6%. Now, Pearsall's is a wee bit lower, <laughs> but Malik's was on 138 targets, which is almost twice as many as Pearsall had. So they just peppered him with the ball again. They threw him. At, they threw at him 138 times. He caught 110. Like, yeah, and I that mean, doesn't include. I, I, I can made forgive a few drops back. when you're getting like 10 targets a game. Like that's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, tremendous. He was a captain. 
thickly built power pack of a player runs like a running back once he has the ball in his hands it's one of those things that makes him very very dangerous um runs routes with the balance of an rb you can look at the james madison wheel route for a td the north carolina uh north carolina state screen for a td once he gets the ball in his hands it is very much like trying to tackle a running back low center of gravity powerful lower half pulls through a lot of contact some people might look at the size say oh he's only five nine does i bet he doesn't break tackles mm, nope not true he does excellent spin move after the catch out and up is a money route for him and this again sort of lends towards that kind of looks like a running back but runs and catches like a wide receiver he sells the out and up like nobody's business and then he's wide open you see a lot of a lot of catches on his tape where he's wide ass open. He wind it back. They're like, how'd that happen? Oh, it was out and up. And they bit hard on the out. Once he turned up, they had no chance. Very quick acceleration up to full speed. Doesn't have great top speed. So if he's really lacking two things as a wide receiver, it's just height and absolute fifth gear. So he's earned all that yak because he is not going to outrun most people. So he has to break through the tackle, spin move, whatever. And he still does. It's a credit to him. Holds his speed through cuts, which I love. So he gets up to speed, his top speed very quickly, and just holds it no matter which way he cuts on the football field. Makes him a very tough cover at the stem. Makes him a very tough tackle after the catch. Um, is also a dangerous returner. So that just leads to his versatility again terrific all-around football player wins at all levels highly productive well thought of captain got a chance to interview him at shrine love 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 malik washington's game how i know he's a great athlete even by nfl standards and again, the, the 42 and a half vert in the, the 10 6 <laughs> well, that, that might tells be you it. a lot, right? <laughs> 447. Like, yeah, the numbers say he's a good athlete. But how I know he's a good athlete. And this, this is something that happened both at Shrine Bowl and at Combine. And I think you might did you fly back, I think, the day before receiver drills? I think you did. Yeah, I was I was only on the field for the first part. I didn't get to see drills. I just got to see like right as they were getting ready to run the 40, all the jumps. So when they were doing, I think it was the post corners. So I was on the sidelines and I was, I was trying to like figure out what angle I could get without getting in the way. Right. (laughs) Or run over or run over. And so I'm sitting there and I, I, I'm watching Malik and I I saw he was coming. I was like, Oh, I want to, I at least want to watch Malik's rep, even if I can't record it. Um, and so he's going through his rep and he's doing all the Malik stuff, like, you know, the head fakes and the instant change direction. I was like, ah, he's so smooth. Looking over, TJ Hushmanzada is just like, oh, okay, holy shit, right? And then he goes up, and I, I don't even know what quarterback threw him the ball, but it was a high ball. And he goes up and he kind of pirouettes and he gets it. And when he comes down, he didn't make a sound. Yeah. It was like a cat. Not even, like, it was silent when he landed I was like oh my god like that's I think I I think there's something to be said for gracefulness in an athlete that that's how you know like you're really really in control of of where of where you're landing and you know sideline awareness is is a skill that most people don't really pay attention to but like he landed both toes inbound didn't make a sound it was like a cat jumping off a wall and I was like okay that's an NFL athlete. Like I understand he's like five, eight and a half, one hundred ninety. I don't care, man. Cause he is so like his body control is so good. And obviously he's built to take contact. I mean, he's, you know, 20 pounds heavier than a lot of guys that are playing in the league at receiver these days. He's got great hands. He's productive as all hell. Great route runner. Got legit speed. Other than height, there's really nothing to not like about Malik Washington, like truly. And that's why I think he's going to be a top 100 pick. Like he's going to be one of these sneaky receivers that goes earlier than people think mm-hmm. because he's a day one starting slot. He really is. Now, maybe he'll slip to the top of the fourth round just because like there's going to be a run on tackles because that's going to run out pretty quick. There's going to be an interior offensive line run. There's going to be a bunch of defensive tackles that go in that range. Like it's possible he slips, you know, corner. There's going to be a bunch that go off in that range. But he ain't slipping past early day three, like early, early day three. Like he's he is that good and he is that reliable. 
Not to mention, I'm sure he interviewed very well, and there's going to be some coach just climbing over the table trying to wring his GM's <laughs> neck of like, please get him in the room for me. Like, he's he's great. Love Malik. Yeah, he's going to be a starting slot right off. Again, probably 80% of his alignment in college was slot. Didn't slide outside very much. So that that could be a knock depending on if your team really needs, you know, an outside wide receiver or outside speed. Pearsall certainly had uh, a much more you know, even split was high 40 percentage in the slot, high 40 percentage outside, and then a bunch of miscellaneous. So that could potentially be a knock, but just watching him as a football player, a lot like Josh Downs for me last year, I, I couldn't leave him off the list. Incredibly productive, great physical skills, great dude. And, you know, fulfills the description, right? Once it's in the name, got to catch the ball does it everywhere all over the field and does quite a bit with it after he catches the ball. So tremendous athlete, tremendous player. I think he's going to be a very productive pro. Now my fifth and final gem, and I'm really just using this as an excuse to talk about him because I think the narrative around him has gotten really out of control to the point where somehow Drake may is an underrated prospect. <laughs> you know, the guy who'd be the first overall pick in a lot of draft classes. Uh, he he is now being talked about by, by some people as QB4, or in some cases QB6 in this mm-hmm. draft. And I don't get it. Like, you want to make an argument for Jaden Daniels at QB2. That's fine. I like Jaden at QB2. I mean, I wouldn't do it. Like, I don't understand totally why you would not take Dre at, Drake at two. But like for specifically the commanders, if it's like, hey, we want a guy you could throw a really mean slot fade to Terry McLaurin, like, yeah, that's that's Jaden Daniels. He's going to do that really, really well. Uh, he's got a tremendous arm. He's very mobile. He's a good kit. Like the, the, the ascension curve has been steady for Jaden Daniels. Like... It, there is part of me that understands why you would argue for that at two. There is no part of me that understands Drake May's QB four, let alone QB six. I I don't I don't get it. And so I want to talk a little bit about Drake May because when I went back and I again I've I've done six games of his as of the time of me recording. I still have probably two more to do because I'm just trying to find something. <laughs> Like, I, I want to know what games people were watching that, that made them put him that far down. But in the six games that I've watched, I see tremendous arm strength, tremendous deep accuracy over the middle of the field. It's one thing to throw go balls to first-round receivers, uh, especially slot fades to first-round receivers, where really you're just throwing to a spot because it's a leverage throw. It's, hey, we got Malik Neighbors, just an example for Jaden Daniels. Hey, we got Malik Neighbors. He's going to slow play the release, and then he's going to run to the pylon. Put the ball at the pylon, Malik's going to beat the guy there. It's Especially against a single high look, like, it's the safest throw you can make. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing, if you're running a vertical concept where we're snapping the ball, we're turning the back of the defense, we're doing a run fake, we're getting our head around, and then we have a clear out post and then a post behind it, and we're reading the safety and we're figuring out where to put it, and then we got we to gotta put not only a, a throw deep down the field, but a layered throw deep down the field that can get it out in front of the receiver horizontally and also behind him vertically so the corner doesn't undercut it. That is a really tough throw to make. He did that routinely. Like, if you're looking at his passing chart, nobody threw deep posts and seam routes better than Drake May. And I I don't understand why we're just forgetting about that. Are there some inconsistencies in terms of, uh, let's say, decision-making under pressure? Sure. There were some, especially when he had to scramble to his right, he just, for whatever reason, didn't didn't see defenders in front of him sometimes and threw a couple really bad picks, but a couple really bad picks. His turnover worthy play rate was under 2%. Okay. It's not like he turned the ball over all the fucking time. It happened like four times the entire year where it's like, ah, that's a bad pick. And also, by the way, the reason why he was having some of these hero ball moments is because the team around him wasn't very good. 
very similar to Caleb Williams, right? Where like protection wasn't good. Um, he didn't get Tez Walker uh, in his receiving core until like halfway through the year because of that whole situation. Like he didn't have a lot to work with relative to both Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix. I would even say Bo Nix. Uh, definitely not compared to JJ McCarthy. Like he was asked to carry a very underwhelming North Carolina roster. And he did it. He was asked to throw the ball deep down the field, mostly to receivers that are not going to be on NFL rosters. He had the 12th highest average depth of target in the entire country last year, 11.5. That's really deep. That's like almost twice what Bo Nix was. His air yards percentage, meaning how much of his passing yardage was coming through the air rather than relying on yards after the catch, was 14th. 62.9% of his yardage was through the air, which is, Drake, you better make this throw because that's the only way we're getting these yards. We're not throwing screens. We're not not relying on guys to, you know, Malachi Corley this thing and catch the ball and run. Like, every yard we get is going to be because of you, buddy. The completion percentage wasn't super high, but again, with an average depth of target like that, that is understandable. He had 25 drops. 25 Mm -hmm. drops, okay? (laughs) Like, only a 25% play action rate. That's not a lot relative to a lot of guys, uh, let alone in the NFL, but also in college. He was asked to do everything. So, yeah, there's some really bad picks on tape, but not as many as there should have been because a lot of other lesser quarterbacks have thrown into that situation are throwing, like, 20 picks. Like, truly, they're throwing, like, 20 picks. So... You want to take Jaden at two? Fine. I get it. He fits what Cliff is probably going to do with them, let alone those receivers. Like, that's understandable. Drake May is not QB4, guys. What are we doing? Like, I I do not understand that narrative at all. And we are now at the point where people are vastly underrating what Drake May is as a prospect. And it's... It's insane to me. Like, he's going to go to the Patriots at three, and then he's going to be good. And we're going to look back in a few years and be like, boy, who saw that coming? I don't know. Fucking everybody, I guess. Like, <laughs> what What am I missing, EJ? <laughs> it's not that you're missing anything at all. And I agree with you. If you get lower than about three on the quarterback ranking this year and you don't have Drake May's name on there, I, I want a good reason why. I don't want your most recent reason why. I don't want recency bias i don't want you over inflating a few negative plays for may and over inflating a few positive plays for whoever you are pushing up into that top three and that seems to be what happens this time of year when people talk about prospect fatigue that's like we've watched drake may play quarterback pretty darn well for two years and by pretty darn well i mean at a very high level for a college quarterback he's got great size good arm He's faster than people think he is. Manipulates the pocket very well with his feet, too, which I think a lot of people just kind of discount. And that's the thing is they they take all these things that he does really well or at a very high level and say, yeah, but there was this one thing. Or there's inconsistency on these throws. There are. He stretches his base sometimes too long. It's a very correctable thing. (laughs) That is not a, like, oh, God, fatal flaw, never going to fix it. Nobody ever gets better at that kind of a thing. It's like shorten your base. Like be a little bit more consistent on those shorter throws, those uh, what I would call less consequential throws. He is not near as machined as a few other quarterbacks in this draft are at those throws. I get it. But despite that, still put up the numbers he did for two full years. Again, there were some changes. Uh, I think DJ and a a few others were having a discussion on their pod, and they said a lot of sins are forgiven when you figure out what was going on at UNC this year for things that you see on Drake May's tape. And I believe that to be true. Look, we'll have our final quarterback rankings out. He's going to be in the top three, and I just don't see any reason. And I've watched the guys below him at this point, and it is. It's selective, like, oh, well, I really like this one thing that, you know, number four, or number five, or number six does. So I'm going to slide him up because of that, or I think that's much more meaningful in the NFL. And there's just these couple of small flaws that I'm going to, again, assign way too much weight for for Drake May and just forget about the size, the running ability, the arm, the accuracy, the production, um, all the things that he's got 
in spades on tape, like over and over and over again. Uh, and that's, I think, what prospect fatigue really is. We just kind of get tired of him being good and being up there. Doesn't really sell any, you know, digital ad clicks if we say, oh, well, Drake May is as good as everybody thinks he is. <laughs> like, that's just not a thing. So, uh, I, you know, I have seen him slide down to four on some people's boards. Haven't seen him as far down as six. At that point, you're really like, Hey, what kind of heresy is this? What are you trying to do? He, he, he knows who he is. Somebody's money. He knows yeah. who he is that that did that. I I do, and I <sighs> I'm fully aware of what those rankings are for. Uh, you know, Drake May is not <laughs> the sixth best quarterback in this draft. I don't think. You know, again, landing spot is tremendously important for quarterbacks. We'll talk about it all day long. Could Drake May bust? Sure. Uh, on average, one out of every two quarterbacks taken in the top five is going to bust. Like or not perform to expectations. Bust is a is a very loaded word. Could he be a very average, like mid tier starter to high end backup? That is absolutely a potential destination for Drake May. Could he also be a top tier, top fifteen starter in the NFL that leads his team to the playoffs regularly? Oh yeah, that is well within his range too. And I would guess slightly more likely, but both options are possible. It really is the eye of the beholder this time of year. What people are putting weight towards, who they watched last, what they're excited about, what kind of qualities they want. And, you know, if you want, like, exp- well, that's the thing. is just about anything you want, you can probably get out of Drake May. If you want him to throw, like, 18 to 20 screens a game, yeah, he might be QB5 for you. But what are you really <laughs> doing if that's what you want to do with a top three quarterback in this draft? As of the time of recording this, we haven't uh, we haven't done our episode with uh, with JT O'Sullivan QB School, but uh, I think next week we are recording that, and so we will be able to pick his brain uh, on all things Drake May, as well as Jane Daniels and Caleb and Penix and Nicks, and and we'll be able to get a very informed opinion. Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I have to imagine he's got May somewhere in the top five. So uh, I'll be able to to pester him about that when he's here. Uh, Might be very and, awkward just, if he's QB seven for JT. We'll see. <laughs> I'll be like, you know, if JT's saying it, I might believe it. Oh, <laughs> uh, we should talk about but only because mentions. he's JT. We should talk about honorable mentions and get ourselves out of here um, again. We don't care that this one's long. It's one of our favorite episodes of the year, but I'm just going to rip through my honorable mentions, name them off. Uh, These are all players that were in consideration. Again, it's only a five-player list for the entire draft for each one of us, so we're going to have some spillover, and these are very talented players who, again, just pass the eye test. We love watching them. Bucky Irving, running back from Oregon. Ray Davis, also running back. Uh, Kamani Vidal running back from Troy, Ian Wheeler, the running back from Howard. That's a Neems guy. Uh, If you haven't checked him out, go down the board, check him out a little bit. Jalen McMillan, the other receiver from UW. I am higher on him than most people. Ricky Pearsall, as I mentioned before, Anaya Smith from Texas A&M. People are forgetting about Anaya Smith. Go check him out. Jatavian Sanders, the other tight end in this draft that's going to get drafted really highly. Jaheim Bell from Florida State. A little bit undersized, but again, just a sort of great offensive weapon. Don't get hung up on the tight end moniker. Um, Zach Frazier, JPG, and Graham Barton, all three center interior offensive line prospects in this draft that I really, really like. And then one of my favorite tackles down the board, more of a swing tackle, Dominic Pooney from Kansas. Um, Really like his game. So that's my honorable mention list. Who's on yours? Uh, A couple studs at the top, but also guys that we just – got very acquainted with up close and personal at, at Shrine Bowl because uh, I'll tell you what, that Shrine roster was really good this year. There's a lot of guys that I really, really liked. Um, but I'll start with the Marius Mims at the top. I think he's going to be a top 20 pick because <laughs> even though he only had, I know it was less than 120 true pass protection snaps over the last couple of years combined, it, it, you really only needed that was just the 120 of like yeah he's he's pretty good like he's really really good he's a freak of nature and um even though he doesn't have a lot of experience he certainly plays like he does so mary smims uh you are a philadelphia eagle congratulations uh hunter zod penn state center shocker another really athletic penn state center it's almost like it's 
any other year. Uh, they, they have <laughs> talent for, for putting those in the league. Uh, Theo Johnson, athletic Penn State tight end. Shocker. Like, I don't know what's in the water over feels, there, but they just feels weird they to put athletic before anybody from Penn State. It feels like it should just be an automatic <laughs> add on at this point. Yeah. It's, if, if you go to Penn State and your RAS is in at least nine five, what were you doing the last three years? My God. Uh, speaking of freak athletes, Isaac Garendo, uh, who might end up as like RB5 in this class for me, because I've gone through this running backs class, which, by the way, the reason why all these free agent running backs got signed is because of this running backs class. Not a whole lot of ones that I'm really excited about. Isaac Garendo happens to be one of the ones that I am very excited about. We'll have an interview with him dropping pretty soon, by the way. Um, but, it, you know, off the charts, tester, crazy athlete. One of the best kind of one cut and go outside zone ish type running backs in this class. Uh, love me some Isaac or, uh, Isaac Rendo. Cornelius Johnson, the other Michigan receiver, who was uh, he was kind of the the under the radar dirty work kind of guy for them. Uh, he led them in catches on both first and second down by a mile. Roman Wilson, however, led them in explosives and third downs and, and every, like Roman I think got a lot of the the press and the attention but if you're looking at who was keeping that offense on track and humming it's Cornelius Johnson like and he's he's got kind of a Nico Collins type profile too size speed flexibility like I, I think he's gonna be a much more productive pro than he was in college just because of where he played uh, also just a quality dude really like Cornelius Johnson Taj Washington, um, I think he was not, his skill set was not maximized at USC for what he is. He is a great separator and a great vertical weapon that unfortunately was asked to run a hell of a lot of curl routes last year against man coverage. Thanks for that, Lincoln. (laughs) Didn't really maximize what you had there. A lot of people talk about this USC receiving core being bad. It wasn't bad. They got two guys that are going to be in the NFL next year that were their starting receivers. They just, they, they were not maximized by that system to put it diplomatically. Uh, Jalen Coker, freaky athlete, 42 plus inch vert, Holy Cross kid who just smoked everybody because he played at Holy Cross, but then he went to the Shrine Bowl and smoked everybody there too uh, before he went out with a calf injury, but really, really athletic uh, somebody's going to take a chance on him mid to late day three, just because the athlete that he is. Zach Hines, uh, six seven wide tight end from South Dakota State. He was one of the seven NFL players that South Dakota State lined up right next to each other on any given play between center, guard, left tackle, tight end, receiver, receiver, running back. Like they were just loaded on that offense, and Zach Hines was was one of the forgotten guys there, but he's a really, really intriguing late round tight end prospect. And then his left tackle right next to him, Garrett Greenfield, who had a 38 inch vert as a tackle, which is a record, like easily a record, but also just astonishing. Um, When we were kind of going into our pre shrine bowl study, I was like, man, this left tackle is a really explosive first step. I think he might, end up being something in the league and then he goes and has a 38 inch vert and I'm like oh yeah explosive first step how about that (laughs) that would explain that so uh, I think he's got tools on tools on tools he's going to be a mid-round pick as well and uh, could potentially find his way onto the field fairly early too yeah I think Garrett's got a lot of young Brian O'Neill that's a guy I've said again super Mm -hmm. athletic just a great mover Wasn't a super high pick, has a lot of tools to develop. And fun fact about Zach Hines, we asked all the South Dakota State guys, they said Zach Hines, even though they've got a couple of receivers who are probably going to get drafted, a very highly drafted running back, they said Zach Hines had the best hands on the team. And he said, anybody will tell you that too. Like, that's it's not a contested fact. Like, Zach Hines, 6'7", can, it looks like a tackle on the field, moving people in the run game, also has the best hands. So some sneaky value there. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's watching and listening to the show, wherever you happen to be. I uh, also want to thank our executive producers on the Patreon, Iken, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Once again, thank you all of you for your uh, continued 
and unwavering support. Uh, we owe you guys everything for helping us do this show. Uh, and for everybody else who isn't on the Patreon, but would still like to support us, even if it's indirectly, you can do so at Homage, who's our clothing partner. You don't even have to buy bootleg merch, even though we'd appreciate it if you do. But if you just want to buy merch representing your favorite NFL team or NFL Blitz or National Parks or your favorite random 90s Nickelodeon show, they probably have the license for it. Uh, so anything you happen to like, if you buy anything from Homage uh, using our link, we actually get a cut of it. So indirectly supports the show and we get an even bigger cut if you buy something from Bootleg in the Bootleg collection. So keep that in mind as well. Um, before we get out of here, EJ, any final thoughts? Can't wait to do defense. Can't wait. Yeah, defense might actually be harder than offense because I was kind of going through my list and I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> There's like 20 names that I but really like, don't want to leave off. <laughs> it's the best conundrum of the year, honestly. The, the arguments and the sort of mental gymnastics we have to go through to cut down all of the great players in a draft to five on one side of the ball and five on the other. Some of the best and most fun work that we do all year and some of the best arguments we have all year as well, like, Brett said he's going to get off and send me a bunch of clips tonight and try and be like, no, no, you're not right about that. I do the same thing to him. Um, we hope that you really enjoy the content, that you stick with us for all the other content. Check out all the interviews from the Shrine Bowl. Those are going to start to drop on the channel. Obviously, the guest list that we dropped last week, everybody was really supportive of that. Uh, we're looking forward to starting to talk to those people, get those recorded and out to you as well. Just going to be draft content left, right, and center until the thing actually happens. We will see you guys very soon with that second half of this gem series. And uh, until then, later.